attention, duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Ominous broadcasts. MSM meltdowns and tea time for old rock stars. Plus, this day in history with the Alaska AWACS crash and our song of the day by Morrissey. On your morning monarchy for September 22nd, 2017, I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome back to another listener supported blast of independent news, music, and more brought to you by you. Streaming live, MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. It's the last day of the week. Glad you made it here to Friday. Hashtag media memes. We look at the entertainment industrial complex today, and we're glad you're here. We're not only crowdfunded, we are crowdsourced. All our news brought to you by you. And again, huge thanks to all our patrons and supporters at MediaMonarchy.com slash support. I got a little bit of an update about yesterday's song of the day that we played by Trevor Something. Turns out Trevor Something isn't a secret fan of Media Monarchy. Our longtime buddy Jeff C. actually sent that record from Trevor Something. Either way, we're super stoked and we're glad to play it for you and we're glad to make friends and bring people together. This is not divide and conquer, left-right, phony, alternative media. We've been around for 12 years and a week as Media Monarchy. And you never heard an ad, you've never heard us wildly pitch different ideas that seem to go against everything we've talked about. We're truly authentic, independent media. Super glad you're here. Oh my goodness, it is going to be a busy episode. Entertainment Industrial Complex. Hashtag Media Memes. All the stories we're going to talk about, we tweeted out an hour before showtime. You can find the stories, and you can also find the invite to the chat. Huge thanks to everybody that hangs out in the chat. That's Heather, that's Mr. Empty, that's Head in a Jar. You can also listen to the show within the Discord chat. Super handy, super easy. Let's glance at the breaking lamestream news before we dive into entertainment. Hopefully it's a little bit of edutainment as well. North Korea hits new levels of brinksmanship in reacting to Trump. Are you scared yet? Rocket Man versus the Dotard. Yes, Dotard being the new word invented yesterday by Kim Jong-un, I believe. So many fun invented words. And geez, we thought all the funny names and words were coming from bands that we talk about. But nope, Kofivi and Dotard meet 2017. Puerto Rico... Destroyed by Hurricane Maria, Cassidy Graham's abortion ban workaround, Facebook's Frankenstein moment. Hey, don't worry. Facebook's going to save our democracy. (laughs) Uber loses its license to operate in London because my roads, my taxis. And Eric Prince's sister rescinds Obama-era rules on campus sexual assault cases. They call it the Rolling Stone rules. Glancing at your fact check. As you know, you got to talk talk about some kind of bullshit around the water cooler, right? Strictly come dancing. Can you predict the winner? BBC's asking, is Jimmy Kimmel right about Obamacare repeal bills failings? You better go to the Columbia Broadcasting System for that. Trump's misleading claim on pre-existing protections in Graham Cassidy. That's on PolitiFact. And Iowa to discontinue soda and candy for EBT residents on October 1st, 2017. Oh my goodness, you better head to Snopes for that. And I'm sure I probably know the answer to that. Hey, guess what? Poor people on welfare, they would love for you to keep eating soda and candy. So keep gobbling it up, dummies. Kim Kardashian banned Kanye West from New York Fashion Week? Well, we better just head on over post-haste to Gossip Cop. And that's your fact check for your Friday. Now, generally speaking on... Each day of the week, you know, we've got a different subject that we talk about. World news, technology, food, health, and environment news, the strange occult underbelly, and right here, media memes. Generally speaking, each day of the week, there's maybe going to be a story that everybody sent in. And today, without a doubt, that story is easily end of world prediction interrupts TV broadcasts in Orange County. Some Orange County residents, hashtag behind the orange curtain. We're stunned Thursday, September 21st, which, again, astute eyes will notice that the OC Register actually had the date wrong in their original pressing of this article. Some cached versions, you can still see them say, Thursday, September 22nd. Yeah, that's wrong. It was the 21st. When television programming was suddenly interrupted for about a minute with an ominous message predicting the end of the world. All right. Good stuff. Pretty pretty scary, eh? Stacy LaFlamme of Lake Forest said she was watching the HTV. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan hey, Gamus. Jonathan, shut up, dude. We're not ready for sports. 
<laughs> Stacy Laflamme of Lake Forest said she was watching HGTV via Cox Communication, as I think my parents do, at about 11.05 a.m. when suddenly an emergency alert flashed across her screen, followed by a voice, realize this, extremely violent times will come. A man's voice boomed, according to a video alert. La Flamme says she was alarmed. It, it almost sounded like Hitler talking, which was the style at the time. It sounded like a radio broadcast coming through, coming through the television. In addition to Cox, Spectrum cable customers in Orange County received the threat as well. I was definitely startled because the volume increased exponentially. I assumed it was some sort of hack. And it probably was. End of world prediction interrupts TV broadcasts in Orange County. Yeah, it almost sounded like Hitler talking. Let's see it again. This is the deranged, obsessed operations of Susie Soccer Mom and Joe 12-Pack. Uh, Hitler, I, I hear Nazis and stuff on, on the TV. Loud authoritative voice equals Hitler. Exactly. That's it again. Hello, 2017. Now, surprise, surprise... Guess what? We already got this case solved for you. And a huge thanks to Swagger Prance on the tweets. Solved! Hey, guess what? They recognize that voice. That's Chuck Swindoll. Yeah. Insight for living. When we watch the moral demise of our culture. Uh -huh. It's tempting to feel completely defeated. Yep. When sacred institutions are dismantled yep, in the like name church. of tolerance. Yeah, and schools when government and stuff. spending is borrowed against our future. Boy, howdy. And when leaders choose compromise over integrity, uh -huh. it truly feels like we're living in the end times. <laughs> Today on Insight for Living, yeah, that's what Jesus Chuck said. Swindoll teaches from Paul's second letter to Timothy. Oh, where Saul? these no, disheartening okay. trends were predicted. And even in light of the corruption that's so pervasive, so pervasive. we'll be reminded that God is still in control. Mm -hmm. Chuck titled today's message, Depravity on Parade. Oh, that's a good one. I, I love that album. I, th I think it comes out today on record release day. Mystery Science Monarchy. Realize this, that in the last days, oh. extremely violent Time oh, hey, come. there's that voice. The term means hard, harsh. Hard, hard harsh. to deal with. Vicious, dangerous, menacing. Damn Skippy Chuck Swindoll. Depravity on Parade, Part 3, published pretty much today. Hey, fix that for you. 56 seconds in, Depravity on Parade, Part 3, Chuck Swindoll, ChristianRadio.com. All right. Good job, everybody. Have a good weekend. <laughs> You're listening to Your Morning Monarchy for Friday, September 22nd, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com, poking a hole in a bunch of mainstream bullshit that you're probably not supposed to fall for. You know, we've been busting fake news since before we had that term. And we're glad you're here. Now, of course, in my ongoing, continuing effort to give you just nonstop Narcos news this week, here's more Narcos news. The brother of the late Pablo Escobar has sent a chilling message to Netflix after a Narcos location scout was shot dead, as we reported for you yesterday, urging them to hire hitmen and security. Earlier this month, 37-year-old Carlos Munoz Portal was scouting locations, you know, places to shoot. Season 4 of the popular limited hangout Netflix series before his bullet-riddled body and car were found in a remote area near the borders of Hidalgo State, a hugely violent area of Mexico. Now, in a new interview with a Hollywood reporter, 71-year-old Roberto de Jesus Escobar Gaviria, formerly known as Chief of the Hitmen, which I would argue is much catchier, has strongly spoken against Netflix returning the film in the area without his permission. <laughs> oh my goodness. I don't want Netflix or any other film production company to film any movies in Medellin or Colombia that relates to me or my brother Pablo without authorization from Escobar, Inc. It's very dangerous, especially without our blessing. This is my country. Asked about what measures Netflix should take to increase security for their Narcos crew, he replied, quote, You have to eliminate all threats. When I was walking in the jungle one day, I had a bag with $2 million in $100 bills. The army was searching for me and Pablo at this time. Suddenly, we were being shot at. Last year, Roberto de Jesus Escobar Gaviria demanded a, a billion, with a B as in boy, a billion dollars from the show for using his brother's likeness without the family's permission. Now he's threatening legal action and to, quote, 
close the little show down. Netflix are scared. He said, they sent us a long letter to threaten us. Right now, we're in discussions with them through our attorneys, Brown George Ross LLP, to obtain our billion dollar payment. If we don't receive it, we will close their little show. And of course, they will say, he'll say hello to my little friend. Pablo Escobar's brother sends chilling message to Netflix over Narcos. At least that's the kind of clickbaity enemy headline. And we've been talking about this, and in a lot of ways we, tr- we tried to get ahead of the Barry Seal film early this year. We talked about Tom Cruise and CIA filmmaker Doug Lyman and American Made. Interestingly enough, and now we haven't dived totally into this, they released American Made not in America. They're testing it out overseas. Now maybe, you know, we'll have to figure out they'll have to make some sort of eyes wide shut like chops before they can release it to the stupid American audience. A lot of, a lot, a lot of deep state propaganda. And again, they gobble it all up and they sell it back to you. They lie and cheat and kill and steal because everybody's doing it. And you're outraged. But then they make a TV show about it and you're really into it. So for the first of two times today, let's all head to the theater for a little bit of predictive programming first in the form of Geostorm. Senate committee will now hear from Jacob Lawson, Climate ISS Chief Coordinator. May the record reflect that he was nearly one hour late. Yeah, sorry about that. I literally had to fly in from outer space. Thanks to the system of satellites, natural disasters have become a thing of the past. We can control our weather. Mr. President. One of our thermospheric satellites malfunctioned over Afghanistan. So your proposal is what? We shut down all satellites. I don't need to remind all of you how many people died from catastrophic climate conditions. Make sure there's no further incidents. Are you going back up to space? But I'm coming back. I promise. Have a safe trip, sir. Just don't touch anything. Main engine stop. This is Mr. Jake Lawson. The Jake Lawson? You look much older than I would have thought. I, I mean, you, you look good. Am I getting fired? My access has been blocked. So satellite has a bad con, that happens. Not a satellite. All of them. This wasn't a malfunction. It was intentional. There's potential for catastrophic weather events on a global scale. A geostorm. We have to shut the system down. <laughs> the only one who has the kill codes is the president. I need your help. You're soliciting a secret service agent. Seriously? We're kidnapping the president in a self-driving cat. <laughs> Jake, if you can't stop it, no one can. Oh, yeah, I kidnapped the president. I've stolen state secrets. Yeah, anything I'm forgetting, honey? Honey. Hold on! Are you? The president has been kidnapped by ninjas. Oh, wait, this isn't bad, dudes. This is another terrible bit of predictive programming starring Gerard Butler as Bruce Willis. Featuring the same classic rock songs and the loud-ass cuts. I watched a video yesterday, of course, all the recommendations. I've got a fantastic YouTube recommendation coming up at the end of this episode. I think we can file under a bit of good news. I think every nerd I know had this video recommended to them. And then, of course, they in turn recommended to me. I was like, I already saw Fran. We'll get to that a little bit later in this Morning Monarchy episode. But yeah. Sounds like Escape from New York. Sounds like 2012. Sounds like a million different movies. So this clip I watched yesterday on YouTube called The Hollywood Crash is Near. And then I realized it's a year and a half old. The Hollywood Crash is here. So here's the question asked in the chat, the musical question. Is it the people that watch them that suck or the movies themselves? 
Yes, is the answer to that question, because it is a vicious circle. Who's paying for this crap? Uh, I guess they'll make stupid superhero movies, but I should go see it a bunch. So pretty interesting as we have not seen a mainstream big star movie, and I believe that was Andy Garcia as the president. Of course, you'll see lots of other regular West Wing critters and all those kind of regular-ass TV character actors. Will there be nuggets in there? I mean, isn't that what Snowpiercer's about? Oh, yeah, we tried to geoengineer the world and fucked it all up, so now we all have to live on a train that never stops. Are they preparing us? Well, again, all you gotta do is look outside. Yes, they are spraying the skies. Now, remember, if you say chemtrails, you're a super conspiracy nutball, but if you say stratospheric aerosolized injection and geoengineering, you start to get a little bit closer to the page. We're looking at the entertainment industrial complex on your morning monarchy. And again with Radiohead, a judge in Canada has stayed the charges stemming from a stage collapse at Radiohead's 2012 concert in Toronto, which killed the band's drum tech, Scott Johnson. Judge Ann Nelson gave the order to halt the proceedings, at least for now, after numerous trial delays. Nelson's decision was prompted by the Canadian Supreme Court's new trial time restrictions, which were established in 2016 and state that cases in provincial courts should go to trial within 18 months. However, it is possible that the charges could be revived within a year if an appeal is filed. The June 2012 incident at Toronto's Downsview Park took place prior to Radiohead's performance. A piece of outdoor structure fell, crushing and killing Johnson, age 33, and hurting three others. Shortly after the collapse, the Ontario Ministry of Labour began investigating the concert promoter Live Nation Canada. In 2013, Live Nation was charged by the Ministry of Labour. They also charged the scaffolding company, optics, staging and services, and engineer Dominic Culliari under the province's Occupational Health and Safety Act, OSHA. Live Nation, of course, denied any wrongdoing. So the case went to trial. This is basically a big bunch of Kafka-esque back and forths. Tom York voiced frustration about the standstill trial concerning the 2012 death of a Radiohead drum technician, Scott Johnson, from a stage collapse. Words utterly fail me. Tom York wrote on Twitter, quoting a tweet by the band Caribou, Dan Snaith a.k.a. Manitoba, a.k.a. Caribou. We've seen him here in Portland. Fantastic live electronic music. They would have supported Radiohead at that Toronto concert. Caribou wrote of the standstill, quote, as someone who was standing behind this stage when it collapsed and would have been on it in an hour later, this is complete bullshit. So then, the other update. Radiohead released a statement on the death of drum technician. And the ensuing trial stands still. We are appalled by the decision to stay the charges against Live Nation. Well, this is the question. This is the thing. When you get into bed with these corporations, you really run out of choices. Arcade Fire can come out and say, Oh, well, that wasn't our dress code policy. It, it was Apple's. Well, you're in bed with them. And I believe, as it was maybe said in the film Pulp Fiction, you don't get into bed with them without getting fucked. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Friday, September 22nd, 2017, and I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. It seems like every Friday, we've got a rack of obituaries. Film director Martin Scorsese paid tribute to the larger-than-life Jake LaMotta following the death of the former world middleweight champion boxer. LaMotta passed away this past Tuesday at the age of 95. He was, of course, the inspiration behind Scorsese's 1980 classic Raging Bull, which starred Robert De Niro as a young LaMotta looking to earn himself a world title shot in the ring. Scorsese met LaMotta on a number of occasions and agreed to direct the biofilm when he drew comparisons to the New York native story, with Raging Bull, of course, going on to attract critical acclaim for De Niro's performance and the narrative of LaMotta's life. Again, film nerds. So we can have one moment to say, God, movies are fucking terrible. I can't go to them anymore. Uh, uh, except, you know, the main artists that make these films. And again, in that clip I was watching, Hollywood crashes near. They noted that Martin Scorsese has had difficulty raising funding for his films. Meanwhile, the Tetris trilogy coming soon to a megaplex near you. Some say Raging Bull greater than Taxi Driver, and that's a debate and a discussion we can have some other time. Actor and musician Harry Dean Stanton has died. He was 91. Cause of death not yet announced or released. Pitchfork reached out for comment. They haven't reported yet. 
Known for his character work, Harry Dean Stanton began appearing in TV and film projects in the 50s. He once said he'd been in over 200 movies. Some of his most notable were 1979's Alien, 1981's Escape from New York, and 92's Twin Peaks, Fire Walk With Me. In recent years, Stanton had regular roles on HBO's Big Love and Getting On. He also, of course, reprised his Twin Peaks character, Carl Rod, for the revived series. There's nobody like Harry Dean, David Lynch wrote in a statement. Everybody loved him, and with good reason. David Lynch, also in The Hollywood Crashes Near, saying, You're a goddamn idiot if you think you've watched a film on your fucking phone. Now, here's a question, and I was actually going to say something about that. How many attempted assassinations did Raging Bull inspire? Now, you, you might be mixing up your movies, but you're pretty close. Here's the interesting part. On the night of the Oscars, when Robert De Niro was about to win for Best Actor for Raging Bull, um, somebody had shot the president. Somebody had taken a shot at Ronald Reagan. So basically that night at the Oscars when Robert De Niro was going to win his big, big, big Oscar and Scorsese and everybody's there, they basically were taken out by the cops because suddenly Taxi Driver was under the microscope. Even more obituaries. Not too bad when your nickname is The Brain. Raymond Lewis Bobby Heenan, generally considered the greatest pro wrestling manager of all time, passed away. He had been battling serious health issues for many years. After contracting cancer first in 2002, Bobby the Brain Heenan was 72. He started out as a wrestling fan in Chicago and, of course, built it up. He was in the WWA, the AWA, and really that's the kind of wrestling that I grew up watching. Kind of the lower end, the almost indie level, the scrappy stuff. We were talking about this recently, Rock and Roll Express and all that stuff. Lillian Ross, the ever-watchful New Yorker reporter whose close narrative style defined a memorable and influential 70-year career, including a revealing portrait of Ernest Hemingway, a classic Hollywood expose, and a confession to an adulterous affair, Lillian Ross has died at the age of 99. I suppose the one positive thing we can say is at least the obituaries this week are all pretty ripe old ages. Ross died early Wednesday at Lenox Hill Hospital after suffering a stroke. New Yorker Articles editor Susan Morrison said Wednesday in an email statement to the Associated Press, New Yorker editor David Remnick called Ross a groundbreaking writer. Lillian would knock my block off for saying so. She'd find it pretentious, but she really was a pioneer, both as a woman writing at the New Yorker and as a truly innovative artist, someone who helped change and shape nonfiction writing in English. Hundreds of Ross's Talk of the Town dispatches appeared in the New York starting in the 1940s when she wrote about Harry Truman's years as a haberdasher and continued well into the 21st century, whether covering a book party at the Friars Club or sitting with the daughters of Richard Rodgers and Oscar Hammerstein as they watch a Broadway revival of South Pacific. After the death of J.D. Salinger in 2010, Lillian Ross wrote a piece about her friendship with the reclusive novelist and former New Yorker contributor. She hated tape recorders. She trusted first impressions and believed in the mystical force that makes the work seem delightfully easy and natural and supremely enjoyable. It's sort of like having sex, she said. So those are the obituaries this week, and we honor them. And as long as we're thinking about the media and thinking about the power of the media, and of course thinking about our motto at the end of every Media Monarchy episode, I think you guys, good stuff. We've had some pretty scary harrowing, heartbreaking video and audio that we've seen in these last several months. And again, 2017 continually tells 2016 to hold its beer. I think we've got another classic, you guys. I think MSNBC's Lawrence O'Donnell may have just now joined the Fuck It, We'll Do It Live Club. Coming up, is Donald Trump going to be called to testify to Congress? Michael Liskoff has the latest on that. Uh -huh. Stop the hammering. Stop the hammering out there. Who's got a hammer? Where is it? I don't know. It's on a Where's the hammer? It's on a is it on the uh, go up on the other floor? Somebody go up there and stop the hammering. Stop the hammering. I'll go down to the goddamn floor myself and stop it. Keep the goddamn commercial break going. 
Call fucking Phil Griffin. I don't care who the fuck you have to call. Stop the hammering. Empty out the goddamn control room and find out where this is going on. It's either there or there or out there somewhere. The woman talking in my ear was talking about the Labor Day special repeatedly every time we went to a SOT. Yeah, what do you mean in the conversation? Not in the Bush thought, no. Fucking out of control shit. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking thing sucks. That's 95 seconds of Lawrence O'Donnell having a complete meltdown on MSNBC's news floor. And guess what? Apparently, there's like 10 more minutes of that shit. I've only heard the little 95 seconds there from Poll News Infinity on the tweets. Looks like having America's next top president live rent-free in your brain might drive you nutters after a little while. I don't think he's related to Christian Bale or other bloviating talent. Yeah. <laughs> Here's another bit of shocking news from behind the scenes in the entertainment industrial complex. The talent often giant pain in the ass. And that crew working around him, you know, there's people getting way less money that are working their asses off that are there till early morning, there till late at night. See crew people kind of dancing around him, trying to still do the thing. I mean, you can even see in the very clip at the very beginning, he knows his first bit, this his first line read. Coming up, is Donald Trump going to be called to testify to Congress? Michael Iskoff has the latest on that. He's already like waving his hand before he even finishes the line because he knows that it's a, it's a dead garbage read. And you're not going to use it. He's basically saying, keep going, I'll, I'll try again. Whew! Good, hilarious stuff. A little bit of schadenfreude on your morning monarchy. You know, some TVs have them announcing the end of the world. Other TV stations have people announcing their own little apocalypse of the soul. So let's have another sip of Schadenfreude's. I do not have a coffee mug being sold by Mark Dice that says liberal tears. I also don't have a shirt that says liberalism, find a cure. Because I know that that's a bunch of phony left-right divide. Just like I kind of thought those people shilling that made in China garbage, I thought they knew that stuff too. Just goes to show sometimes you don't really know. Let's continue to look at the entertainment industrial complex. And just in case you thought this all wasn't a staged wrestling match, and I know I only made brief reference to wrestling legend Bobby the Brain Heenan, but I think it still fits. Heel makes shocking appearance at Faces Party. Sean, do you know? To witness an Emmys, period, both in person and around the world. So, if you didn't know, on Sunday night, Stephen Colbert, you know the guy that acts like he's a politician, he was hosting the Let's Pat Ourselves on the Back Award thing, which, of course, everybody said was a big garbage show because they're obsessed with Trump. They're overcompensating. I can't say this enough. Just all the freakouts over the last year have been because of the overcompensation, the overcorrection. Think about it. It's just the analogy of being on the highway. Oh, shit, I fell asleep for eight years. Oh, God, well, you wake up and you grab the wheel. I almost died in a wreck that way, watching people in front of me overcorrect for their mistakes. And they spun out in the snow. That little 22-second clip, and I'm sure there's a bunch of extra stuff. The joke is, they roll out former White House press secretary Sean Spicer at his little podium. Now, his little podium had already been used by General Electric Comcast Saturday night comedy garbage dump. They've been doing this for months and months and months. This is the only thing they have. Again, Donald Trump has been fantastic boffo box office for the entertainment industrial complex. They can't get enough. The funnest part about this... Watch this little 22-second clip. Again, everything we say and play included in the show notes. 
is to, of course, see the phony left's reaction in the audience. And again, that's why they do it. They're doing it for the ratings. They knew people's jaws would hit the floor. Who, again, can't get enough of America's next top president. The funnest part is to watch the reactions in the audience. Most of the, it's funny, Tony Hale Buster, you can see most of the dudes are actually laughing their holes off. It's the women that look really actually shocked. There's some that look like they are pooping in their pants angry about it. And then others are like, oh my gee. Sean Spicer borrows Melissa McCarthy's podium for a surprise appearance at the Emmys again, putting the lie to this phony left-right bullshit. Just in case you thought this wasn't all a staged wrestling match, heel, that's that's the, the bad guys in wrestling are called heels. The good guys in wrestling, they're called faces. And that's what you're watching on TV. Continuing to look at the crumbling mainstream media, Rolling Stone up for sale as the magazine faces a digital challenge. Now when I load up this, Financial Times doesn't want to let me see the article anymore. Fine, you be that way. But Rolling Stone decided a long time ago that they wanted bullshit political polemics over record reviews, which, you know, was why I would buy the magazine. Corella Ross on the tweets says, They lost me in the 90s, but Jan Winter's softball Obama piece pre-2012 election was the true death knell. Such unadulterated drivel. Speaking of drivel, there's an interesting article on The Fader, and I'm pretty sure it's written by a tried-and-true social justice warrior who, again, gave the previous puppet an eight-year pass while I'm pretty sure he dropped 26,000 bombs in 2016 alone, and I think, if my math is correct, added five more wars on top of the previous puppet to him. Basically, The Fader has a big, long article that's, that's, again, I do not disagree with the basis of it. Three labels control 80% of the U.S. music industry. What responsibility comes with that power? A few thoughts about the big three and corporate complicity. Now exactly they are right, as, as we've been telling you for many moons. Three companies own your everything. But now this article, basically written by Ruth Saxelby, is essentially saying in the recent months the media have responded to the political climate by zooming in on artistic behavior. Have they or haven't they condemned Trump? Where do they stand? Where do they suggest we do to resist? The fader would like to demonstrate what large-scale compassion looks like. And again, this is the question. And they're saying Apple, Airbnb, Facebook, they all signed a motion supporting the legal fight against Trump's Islamophobic travel ban. How complicit are Sony Music, Universal Music Group, and Warner Music Group? These are really interesting questions that you probably should have been asking all your life. So essentially, the fader in social justice overcorrection freakout is saying, oh, the, the, the major labels might only care about money? You mean they might not care about giving me the art that I like? They might just worry about making their shareholders happy? Huh. So again, welcome to the party, pal. I saw Alternative Tentacles yesterday tweeting about they've got their new Nazi Trump's fuck off shirts back in stock. I was like, oh, I guess your President Peace Prize drop 26,000 bombs t-shirts were stuck at the printers for eight years. Let's continue to look at the entertainment industrial complex, my friends, on last Thursday, two Thursdays ago. Think Progress exclusively reported that amid a brewing controversy over Jameel Hill's tweets calling America's next top president a white supremacist, ESPN had initially tried to keep Hill off the air on Wednesday on SportsCenter. But then basically her two co-hosts said they won't go on if she did, and the blah 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 phony left-right battle goes on. So someone on SportsBall said the president is a racist. George Bush doesn't care about black people. But let me continue to work in front for the giant same multinational corporations that push all of this stuff. Again, that's the thing. That's the question. That's, that's what you're asking about on Fader. Let me answer the question for you. No, you can't. Still work for, whore for, all the same multinational corporations that lord over all these things. Who do you think helps push the agenda? Let's keep blasting forward. Toys R Us, the big box toy retailer, struggling with a $5 billion debt and intense online competition 
has filed for bankruptcy protection ahead of the key holiday shopping season and says its stores will remain open for business as usual. The company said the proceedings are a way for Toys R Us to work with its creditors on restructuring the debt beleaguering it. And it emphasized that its stores will remain open worldwide and it'll work with suppliers and selling merchandise. I don't know that I've ever set foot in a Toys R Us in my life. Toys R Us files for bankruptcy, but keeps its stores open as they, of course, hope, pray that it's going to all be about that Christmas holiday season. Christmas holiday season, essentially like the junkie fix for the powers that shouldn't be. They put all their eggs in that basket. That's where all their crappy movies come out. It's, they, they put them all in there. Now, so many things, again, going on. Hopefully, we get ahead of stories like we were talking about earlier. American Made. We told you about that early, early, early in the year. Hopefully, we can kind of lay those, lay the groundwork, lay some of those seeds out. So then when the film comes out, you go, oh, sweet. Daniel Hopsicker's talking about it. Other people are talking about it. Newsbud's talking about it. <laughs> Visiting Toys R Us always felt soul-crushing when I was a child. That could be another reason why they're not doing well. We told you a good year plus in advance what was going to be happening in Washington, D.C. last weekend, and indeed it did go down. Juggalos in Washington. Don't call us a gang. 11, the FBI released um, something called a gang assessment list, and what it was was a top 10 list of, like, you know, I guess the most notorious gangs in the country. And you had, like, the Crips and the Bloods and the MS-13 and the Aryan Nation, and Juggalos were on there. Now, people that follow our music call themselves Juggalos. This is not a name we gave them. Whoop, whoop. It's a name that organically came up from the, the people. Juggalos all wear the same thing. A lot of them wear this logo, which is our record company logo, which also sort of doubles as a symbol for Juggalo. It's the hatchet man. Now, that conversation goes on. Shaggy 2 Dope and Violent J actually talking to Time Magazine. I'm not really sure when that was shot. But the Detroit Free Press has the breakdown, and of course, that's where Insane Clown Posse is from, collecting around a stage set up before the Lincoln Memorial several hundred juggalos. Fans of the Detroit-based hip-hop duo Insane Clown Posse turned out Saturday to listen to music and bring attention to what they say is an unfair gang label from the FBI that's cost some of their face-painted friends and family their jobs, led to harassment by the authorities, and more. Oh no, you can't go to the dead malls and face paint? Now, we've said it before, and we'll say it again. I don't actually have the tweets lined up here. And again, Twitter, at Media Monarchy, is probably the best way to get the most unfiltered output from the kingdom. We told you about the Juggalos March a year in advance, because we'd been reading an advanced copy of Steve Miller's Juggalos and the world they made. Now, when I think about that, I also think about one of my favorites, a frontline documentary from 2001 by Douglas Rushkoff should know his work. It's called The Merchants of Cool. And they basically talk about corporate cool headhunting. They talk about the struggles of the soda companies until they rightly aligned with their right demo and got soda with sports and hip-hop and blah, blah, blah. The entire episode is essentially about the corporatization of street culture. And it shows, the, you know, the, the cool hunters going out, ooh, ooh, can I take a picture of your Slipknot shirt and get your tattoos? Because we know that this is a, a rising trend that we want to exploit and sell back to you. There's one group that is followed in this documentary that, again, is now 16-plus years old. Well, I know, but Slipknot were pretty underground in 01, right? <laughs> and these, yeah, again, these are the things when we post these videos up to YouTube and BitChute. That's what I'll get taken to task for. <laughs> well, you know, that is, of course, after all the fucking crazy Holocaust-denying racist fuck jobs. Of course, they're on there. Yeah, you can go. I, I, I won't miss you. See ya. The only group in the Merchants of Cool that escapes all of this, that transcends all of it, is Insane Clown Posse. They are truly an underground, independent, street-level subculture. And the corporate world couldn't really figure out what to do with it, and they didn't really want to do anything with it. And as has been said, it's not a crime to like shitty music. I salute Insane Clown Posse and everything that they've done. Everything that they've done. 
It's what we're trying to do here in Media Monarchy. Oh, you mean you want to create your own thing by your own rules that you don't answer to other people and you won't have to be on Apple's payroll and you won't have to worry about what Hollywood Records and Disney want you to do? And they kissed a little Disney ass. They tried with the Great Malenko. And it didn't go over well. And they're back to essentially where they are. So whether it's too stupid to be assimilated or too smart to be assimilated, the end result is still goodness. Meanwhile, the Metropolitan Police are reviewing their 696 form over in the UK, which critics have said is used to unfairly target grime, garage, and basement venues. Those are essentially British words for rap. London Mayor Sadiq Khan, of course, canceling Uber, has asked to be has asked for the form to be re-examined after meeting several DJs, artists, and venue owners who all raise concerns about how music is being used. Or rather, how the 696 is being used. The form, introduced back in 2005, is a risk assessment for live music to prevent violence and has long been used to target a disproportionate number of music events by black and Asian artists, particularly grime, garage, and bashment. No, now it's a bashment. He said basement in the first one. Met to review risk assessment from stifling grime and garage scenes. So essentially the same thing happens in the UK. ICP, Wiley. As long as we're staying in the UK. Hashtag beat the bots. Many fans were left disappointed at a Foo Fighter show in London on Tuesday night after they were refused entry for not having appropriate ID matching the name on their ticket. Fans who received their tickets as gifts or bought them from secondary ticketing sites, StubHub and the rest, were turned away at the gate. Is that how you treat your fans? Good grief. Still a lot of stories to go through, and we only got a couple more minutes left. Beyonce's Lemonade vinyl accidentally pressed with Canadian punk band's album. Certain copies of the recent vinyl release of Beyoncé's Lemonade were accidentally pressed with the first half of Canadian punk band Zex's ZEX 2017 album Uphill Battle. Interestingly enough, same thing happened earlier this year when Gordy's debut album Reservoir was mispressed with the then unreleased B-side of Queens of the Stone Age new record Villains. And back in 2015, Baltimore shoegaze band Wild Honey were pressed into Lana Del Rey's Born to Die. So funny enough as that is, then it gets worse. News surfaced that some copies of the recent vinyl release of Beyonce's Lemonade had mistakenly been pressed with the first side of Canadian punk band Zex's new album, Uphill Battle. In wake of that media attention, Pitchfork reports that the band's label, Magic Bullet Records, received several emails accusing guitarist Joe Capital Side of sexual assault. The label has now dropped Zex from its roster and issued a statement. Week in, week out. And this is now, again, this is the 2017 world we live in. Lena Dunham's going to make sure that no American Airlines stewardesses have any wrong thought or bad think about trans kids. And no punk rock labels anymore can tolerate anyone who don't fall in lockstep with your cultural Marxism. So whether you're Power Bottom, whether you are Dream Machine, holy moly, I saw an interview with Matthew Melton of Dream Machine. He was on Greg Gutfield because they got dropped from the OC's label for wrong think. So Polyvinyl Records, Castle Face, they have all really decided their bands have to be politically correct. A little bit of good news. When the crowd lurched forward for the opening notes of Boxcar, you knew it was finally real. Jawbreakers, third show in 21 years, and it's first at anything remotely resembling a main stage of a behemoth like Riot Fest. Sunday night. Chicago crowd got all it could have wanted from the storied, coulda, shoulda been as big as Green Day cult punk's Jawbreaker. Long-awaited reunion pummels Chicago Riot Fest crowd. And maybe this is this is the other part. One of one of the better things you'll see, and I think this was backstage at a Lollapalooza, and this is again the world that we now live in. If only we can force all the Hollywood stars to make their own tea. Yeah, it's good for the voice, so I'm told. It's fucking good, man. Now in the nineties I got someone else to fucking do it, but now I can't fucking money is tight, too tight to mention. Got to do it yourself, aren't you? No one buys records these days. In the 90s, I had about four people doing it. Little geezer doing a kettle, our kid. Some other little <laughs> doing that. And some other little fucking idiot doing that. Now you gotta do your fucking, now you gotta do it yourself these days, you know what I mean? Because these fucking little smart asses download fucking tunes for niche. And they wonder why there's no real rock and roll stars around. 
This is the shit you got us doing, fuckers. There you go. Liam Gallagher making tea backstage at Lollapalooza because now all you fuckers download your own music. Now, if we could only put Melissa McCarthy and the rest of the other terrible Hollywood actors to have to make their own tea backstage. Now, I've run out of time, and I don't have time to play the trailer for the new movie about J. Paul Getty called All the Money in the World. We'll have to maybe save that for another day. Some of our last media memes headlines. Viral star Danielle Brigoli has taken full advantage of her new found fame. Cash Me Outside Girl inks record deal with Atlantic Records. And all that stuff is all pretty bad and pretty depressing, and that's why I said my favorite video this past week. Probably every other music nerd I know had this video recommended to them. It's about Fran's shop in the 45 RPM record. I love the opening bit. Hey, it's Fran again in my shop. (laughs) And today I want to do a video about one of my favorite things in the world. The 45 RPM record. So good. The 45 RPM record. From Fran. (laughs) It doesn't really get any better than that. And that's been basically what I've been saying at the house the last week. Hey, Hey. it's Fran. (laughs) Again. In my shop. shop. I'm James in my shop. And it is New Music Friday as we wrap up the Entertainment Industrial Complex edition of your show. Holy moly, a bunch of new records out. And a lot of them from bands we've been playing for you. Such as... New music from Cut Copy out today. New music from The Clientele out today. The Horrors, His Golden Messenger, Godspeed You Black Emperor, Steve Martin, Mastodon, Shout Out Louds, Josh Ritter, Kusto X. Actually, we're going to play their new stuff today. You got The Wedding Present. You got Ball Maria. We've been playing their stuff. There's new Judy Collins, new John Langford, new Juan, new Bronx. Oh my goodness, Brian Wilson. Oh, you guys, stop the presses. Richmond's going to be excited. New Cradle of Filth out today. That and so many other records are out today. Those stories you can find all in the show notes. Everything we talk about always included in the show notes, my friends. Let's hop quickly to this day in history because I know you're excited to get to, you know, that brand new single from Morrissey. Let's look at this day in history, September 22nd. 1598, English playwright Ben Johnson kills actor Gabriel Spencer in a duel and is indicted for manslaughter. And of course, remember what the now awful Johnny Depp said at Glastonbury a couple weeks ago. When's the last time an actor killed a president? September 22nd, 1776, Nathan Hale hanged for spying during the American Revolution. 1823, Joseph Smith finds the golden plates on this date, you know, after being directed by God. 1888, the first issue of National Geographic magazine is published. We jump into the 20th century. September 22nd, 1927, Jack Dempsey lost the long count boxing match on this day to Gene Tunney. And in 1941, on Jewish New Year Day, that's right, it's Rosh Hashanah, the German SS murdered 6,000 in the Ukraine. And those were the survivors of the previous killing that took place a few days earlier. About 24,000 were killed. Yeah, I just actually, when I was ranting earlier, I saw a little YouTube comment drop-down note. It said, the Holocaust didn't happen. I'm done. Well, no. Are you going to unsubscribe? In the words of Randall, you will be missed. September 22nd, 1957, in Haiti, Francois Papadoc Duvalier is elected president. And in 1964, Fiddler on the Roof opened on Broadway on this day. Because I'm an Israeli shill, right? No, because you don't really look at the work that I've done over 12 years in a week, or even the latest episode of New World Next Week. (gasps) You might also recall earlier this year when we brought you the Rothschild musical. It was from the creators of Fiddler on the Roof. September 22nd, 1965, the Supremes recorded I Hear a Symphony. That same day, The Who began a tour in Scandinavia where Roger Daltrey would punch Keith Moon. The Beatles appeared on the cover of Time Magazine on this day in 1967. Hashtag fake news. September 22nd, 1975. Sarah Jane Moore tried to assassinate Stumbling Jerry Ford, but is foiled by Secret Service agent Oliver Sipple. Basically knocked her hand up just in time. September 22nd, 1979. A bright flash resembling the detonation of a nuclear weapon is observed near the Prince Edwards Island's never-determined cause. 
1980, Iraq invades Iran on this day. That same day, Geffen Records was formed with their first signee, a guy named John Lennon. September 22nd, 1991, the Dead Sea Scrolls are made available to the public for the first time by the California Huntington Library. September 22nd, 1993, a barge strikes a railroad bridge near Mobile, Alabama, causing the deadliest train wreck in Amtrak history, 47 dead. September 22nd, 1995, Time Warner and Turner Broadcasting System announced their fantastic agreement to a $7.5 billion merger. And on this day, September 2nd, 1995, an E-3B AWACS plane crashes outside Elmendorf Air Force Base, Alaska after multiple bird strikes to two of the four engines soon after takeoff, all 24 killed. Gas system, test okay. 20 years ago, from this very runway, I went to for the localizer. a plane, much like the one being flown last week by the 962nd Airborne Air Control Squadron, it's old but it works, all sign Eucla 27, hit a flock of geese and crashed on takeoff killing all 24 aboard. The geese were ingested in the left two engines and it crashed. Aviator sunglasses. Today, the unit's commander, Lieutenant Colonel Eric Gonzalez, Popular back in the day, said he didn't know any of the men aboard Euclid 27. He knows all too well the effect of their sacrifice. For a lot of years after the crash, we would go out to the, the wreckage and you would still find pieces of the airplane uh, I've got a piece of the airplane in my office that's kept on a shelf and some of the personal effects. Those pieces soon to be put inside a time capsule that will be buried at the crash memorial site on Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson. Yeah, I'm getting a little emotional just looking through the stuff here now. All right, so calm never does. Meanwhile, outside. Check set pilot. Pilots and crew prepare their E-3 Airborne Warning and Control System aircraft for a training mission. It's a four-position flight deck, a uh, flight clothes, engineer, man. got a navigator, and then a pilot and a co-pilot. And even after 20 years, the ill-fated flight, the first and only fatal AWACS crash in Air Force history. These are the folks that died that day. Is never very far from their minds. For me, for the most part, I do actually think about that every sortie, if not almost every day. And the crash itself is ingrained in every young E-3 AWACS pilot. They actually fly the exact Eucla 27 mission, complete with the loss of engines while they're in training. And it's a simulator, it's not real. But you could, when the plane comes to a, a stop and the screen goes red because you crashed the simulator, it gets pretty quiet in that sim and it makes it real, even though it's completely fake, but it, it makes it real. It's a practice in looking back for a unit that spends most of its time looking forward, flying high over a battlefield to control U.S. fighter jets and to spot adversaries. This is real. You have the lives of not only yourself, but your crew members in your hands, so you want to make sure that you know your stuff. On September 22nd, the unit and surviving family members of Euclid 27 will come together to remember the crash and the fallen. But they will also be there to celebrate their sacrifice. We wanted to show that there's life after this and that we've moved on and we've grown and we've learned from it. It makes it real even though it's completely fake. Meanwhile, there was in fact at least one AWACS near DC on the morning of 9-11 participating in a war game exercise. The pilot learned of the attack soon after the first hit on the World Trade Center. While at first he thought it was part of the war game exercise, it didn't take long for him to realize it was real. I managed to do a little, a little bit of reaching today on Friday, but that's five of five kind of cyberspace war this day in history. It's all this week. Published to Media Monarchy a decade ago today. That's right, the website's been online for 12 years in a week. And published a decade ago today. Unknowing residents to take part in terror drill, city testing, to quickly distribute antibiotics. Boston residents basically taking part in a bioterror drill and don't even know it. Black Ops Conspiracy and 9-11, an article from Clyde Wilson talking about the history of conspiracies and that that is our history in America. Iran and Israel face off over nuclear weapons. And a little news on the March Post. Colorado Checkpoint takes blood and saliva samples. DHS sponsors martial law exercise for kids. The weird Russian mind control research behind a homeland security contract. And Dan Rather says democracy cannot survive. Two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner can't possibly survive. 
That's why they keep the phony left-right divide going and going and moving and grooving. Holy moly, celebrating birthdays today, September 22nd. Born on this day in 1791, Michael Faraday. Then three biggies in the history of early film, Eric Von Stroheim, Paul Mooney, of course in the Howard Hawks, Howard Hughes, Scarface, and John Houseman. He helped Orson Welles get Citizen Kane rolling. Now I know John Houseman later for all his terrible commercials in the paper chase. Others of you enjoy Faraday's Cage. Also celebrating birthdays today, Tommy Lasorda. He turns 90. And Tony Basil, born on this day in 1943. It's crazy to think Tony Basil is actually older than King Sonny Ade, Nigerian performer who I saw actually at Pickathon a few years ago. David Coverdale from Deep Purple and Whitesnake. And our buddy Richard Fairbrass, English singer-songwriter, musician, and producer for Right Said Fred. Happy birthday, buddy. It's also Debbie Boone's birthday. Holy moly, Nick Cave turns 60. Jeanette Napolitano from Concrete Blonde. It's also Andrea Bocelli's birthday. Neil Cavuto, Joan Jett, Scott Bayo. It's also Bonnie Hunt's birthday. Comedian Matt Besser. Weezer, the best member of Weezer. You know, the one that left in 96. It's Matt Sharp's birthday. Of course, you might know him from the rentals as well. And back that ass up, it is Mystical's birthday. And of course, since we're not on the air tomorrow, on the 23rd, it is the end of the world, as we've been announcing for you. It's also Cassie's birthday. So you can tweet birthday wishes at Cassie Cohn, my amazing wife. As, speaking of amazing, we wrap up another week of Morning Monarchies, and this makes me happy. The brand new single from Stephen Patrick Morrissey. We reported for you a couple of weeks ago, he has created his own label to release his brand new album coming out November 17th. It's going to be called Low in High School. We talked about the cover last week with the kid with an axe outside the gate of the monarchy. Axe the monarchy. Apparently, Morris even started a Twitter account, allegedly. Yeah, who needs labels? He just needs some distro. And a dedicated fan base. First tweet Morrissey sent out earlier this week, all it said was, spent the day in bed. It's like, oh, is he going to tweet about just being lazy and hanging out? No, of course not. Spent the day in bed is the brand new single from Morrissey. And as we've been talking about all this week and even other bands we've played on the show, British duo Castles that we played yesterday, what did they say? Turn off the news. One of the latest thoughts of the day from our buddy James Corbett, what's that say? Turn off the news. And what's the new single from Morrissey say? Turn off the news. Spent the day in bed. The brand new single from Morrissey as we wrap up your morning monarchy. The media memes edition for Friday, September 22nd, 2017. Whether the world ends tomorrow or not, I'll I'll see you Monday morning. Appreciate you. You keep us going. MediaMonarchy.com slash support. Huge thanks. PayPal, Patreon, Bitcoin, the post office box. That's how we keep going. And huge thanks from the bottom of my heart. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Again, thanking you so much for listening. And reminding you, as always, like Jellyby Offer says, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.